Thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Chege from Inter Society. Uh, I'll be making this presentation with my colleague Amrish. So I'll present the first part, and uh, Amrish will present the second part. So uh, presentation is on uh, measuring the resilience in uh, Africa. I'll start with a brief background. Um, so for many in the Africa region, we do experience uh, intermittent connectivity uh, in various times during, during the day as we use the connectivity, as we try to stay uh, online. And uh, finding out the reasons for this is uh, not easy because measurements are distributed and finding accurate information uh, was a challenge. And we did uh, identify this as an issue when uh, discussing with uh, Afrinic in particular. Um, so we set out to find out uh, what is the real experience of an internet user in Africa? Um, how do statistics measure against uh, real user experience? So uh, we know you can use tools to measure uh, connectivity to find out how well uh, co you know, an internet connection is, is working, but how does that relate to the experience on the ground for the internet user? And also we wanted to find out are there policies in uh, countries that have aided uh, good connectivity, uh, there are policies that could be adapted uh, in other, you know, other parts of Africa that would aid, um, you know, connectivity and how people experience uh, the internet, because Africa is, is a very big place and experiences differ uh, from different regions of the continent. So uh, with Afinic, we decided to work on a project which we call MIRA. Uh, MIRA in short stands for uh, Measuring Internet Resilience in Africa, and it has two main uh, objectives. Uh, the first objective is to determine the levels of internet resilience in select countries. Uh, we want to do this by measuring certain metrics um, and want to use scalable me methods so that, uh, as I mentioned, Africa is a big place, you know, 55 plus uh, countries. Uh, we want to do a method that if we use in one country, it can still scale to uh, all the countries in Africa. And I wanted to find a way to aggregate all this information so that it's uh, easy to present, which uh, brings me to the second objective, which is we wanted to share this information in a very uh, easy to understand manner. So whether you're a policymaker, an engineer, or an internet user, you'll be able to uh, find information about internet resilience uh, in your country. So uh, project partners are uh, Internet Society and Afrinic. Uh, those are the main uh, partners. Uh, but we do have uh, other partners in the project. We have the University of Cape Town, uh, Simula, and Carnegie Mellon University, uh, University Africa. Uh, if you go to the link down there, presented on the slide there, pass.intercity.org, uh, you will see more about the resilience uh, project and how we came about um, doing this work and where we've gone so far. So I'll uh, quickly go through where we started. So um, identifying inter resilience or you know, determining how we're going to measure inter resilience, uh, it took a long process. Um, there are many metrics we could, we could measure. We could measure round trip time, we could measure uh, things like uh, uptime, we could measure throughput speeds, and we decided to uh, have a way of collecting this information to determine which metrics should be considered when determining interdisciplines. Uh, we had several discussions between the partners just to uh, identify and rank the metrics because we came out with a, uh, with a very long list of, of metrics to, uh, to measure. And then we took a very long uh, period of time to refine our approach and our methodology, and we put that into a white paper which I'll put the link in, in the chat um, uh, as we move along. Uh, we also took time to identify available tools. We didn't want to uh, reinvent the wheel. We wanted to see what's there and see how we can use it. And um, over the past year and a half or so, we've been uh, learning through the number of challenges we faced and made uh, improvements as we've gone along, which we're going to share in this presentation. So just a quick recap of what we've uh, uh, done so far. We've signed an MOU with Afrinic as of July last year. Uh, let me just mention that uh, though the MOU was signed uh, last year in July, we did start the work a bit earlier. We had identified a, a number of uh, things we want to do even before we signed the, the MOU. Uh, we've published what's called a mirror white paper. The white paper is guiding our approach to this. It covers everything in terms of the methodology and the approach of how we are going, how we are going about this work. Uh, we've tested and deployed the pods infrastructure. Um, this is the uh, pods we're using to measure, uh, you know, to carry out like measurements. Uh, my colleague Amish should talk about that. Uh, we've tested data visualizations. Uh, we're going to demonstrate that in this presentation as well. Uh, we've acquired data sources for what we're calling the Interresilience uh, Index. And we've started uh, data collection for this Interresilience Index. And uh, we are going to cover more about what 
uh, the Inter Resilience Index is and why it's important to what you're doing in Mira. So I'd like to stop here and invite uh, my colleague Amrish and he'll take you through uh, what the Inter Resilience Index is and how far we've gone uh, with that work. Amrish, over to you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Allow me to share my screen quickly. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. All right, uh, so greetings everyone and thank you very much for the opportunity uh, given to us to speak about the work that we are currently doing uh, at the Internet Society and together with our different partners, um, including uh, Afrenic. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Internet Resilience Index, which is one of the components of this research work that we are currently doing. So first of all, why do we need a, a, an index? Um, there are many indis indices out there, um, but there was not one specifically measuring uh, the Internet resilience as such. So the Internet Society came up with a model combining different indicators that depicts some uh, notion of uh, internet resilience. And I'm going to talk about that more uh, in this presentation. Um, so the definition of the index is a composite indicator. Um, as you can imagine, um, an index is built using different metrics. And um, by combining different co indicators together, we can more or less give an indication of what a country's performance is against the four pillars of internet resilience that we have defined. These are the four pillars. Um, first, the first pillar is infrastructure, which is made up of the cable ecosystem, mobile connectivity, and enabling infrastructure. So the cable ecosystem, as you know, is very important to, um, for, internet, for internet traffic in between countries or within the country itself. In Africa, mobile connectivity is extremely important. Some countries rely mostly on mobile connectivity to connect end users. And as you know, enabling technologies, enabling infrastructure such as data centers and IXPs have been very detrimental to, to the success of uh, the internet ecosystem in, in different countries. The next uh, important pillar that we have looked into is performance. It is important that you have a, a good internet uh, which is performing well, and you have adequate bandwidth so that you can enjoy uh, all the benefits of a, a, a secure and a, and a performing internet. So aspects such as bandwidth and latency are, are very important. Then you have the security aspect and all enabling technologies such as DNS, DNSSEC, um, Things such as routing hygiene is very important for the security of the internet and to make sure that uh, the, the ecosystem of the internet, whether it is within your country or outside your country, works, works well. And security threat, for example, uh, is, is your country uh, contributing to generating a lot of spam or does it pose a threat such as DDoS to other countries? So this is important aspects that we consider here in this bill. And finally, market structure is very important. Uh, we want to see whether um, the internet in a country is affordable. It doesn't serve a purpose if the internet is, is robust, but at the end of the day, it's not affordable to, to the end users. So uh, to, do, to collect the data, so we have uh, more than 30 indicators that we have selected for this index, but uh, at the beginning, we, we came up with a, a large number of indicators, but we had to shortlist them and based on a few criteria, the, the, four, the four being the relevance, so the, the, the indicator should depict or should actually give some indication of the resilience in, in a selected country. It should be accurate in terms of the information it is giving us uh, and over time as well. Coverage. Uh, if an indicator is not covering enough countries, then it will not be good enough. Um, similarly, the indicator should, should cover um, a, 
more than 50% of the country should be covered by the indicator so that we have a good um, overall uh, coverage of that indicator for that, for, that, um, for that country. And timeliness as well. So it is important that we are not using all data to calculate an index, but instead we will use uh, fresh data as, as much as possible. So let's look into the first infrastructure. We talked about uh, the three dimensions of the infrastructure pillar. The first one being cable ecosystem. So the first in indicator that we are looking into is the number of international gateways. We would like to, to know here how redundant our country is in terms of you know, international connectivity. So international gateways such as cable landing stations or cross-border uh, fiber, uh, port of presence is actually very important. So we are looking into things such as uh, the fiber reach. Uh, so we are getting information from the, the ITU. So how close are the population uh, with regards to the cable infrastructure and power availability is, is also very important. Some countries have power issues uh, and this is a very common occurrence in, in Africa, for example. We talked about mobile connectivity. So here we are looking into network coverage and spectrum allocation. And this data is coming from G the GSME. And finally, in this pillar, we are also looking at the number of IXPs and the number of data centers, uh, which provides some uh, level of indication about the, the maturity of the, um, of the local ecosystem. Then we look in, into performance as a second pillar. Uh, we look into both fixed networks and mobile networks, and this data is coming from UCLA. So I, UCLA is actually providing their data, um, and they have actually put their data online, so it's, uh, it's accessible to anyone. And the good thing is that you can also have data from UCLA from the last um, five years, for example. They provide upload, download, and the media and, and latency. And by aggregating the data, we can get the, the median uh, upload, download, and, and latency, which we're using for, for this indicator. The third pillar is enabling technologies and security, in which we're looking into things such as IPv6 adoption, uh, HTTPS adoption. We are, we are analyzing the DNS ecosystem, whether uh, the country is actually performing validation and also whether or not they have signed their, their own CCTLD. At the Internet Society, we are currently collecting data about uh, the routing hygiene, and, and, and this is ach achieved through the MANUS uh, Observatory, in which we are collecting data about different ASNs um, across the world. And we have four for, I would say, sub-indicators for the MANUS score, which is filtering, coordination, global validation, and, uh, and RPKI. And aggregating all together, we have a MANUS score, which, which, we, are, which we have injected in this um, pillar. And finally, different sources, such as the World Bank, IDU, CyberGreen, and SpamHost are providing different data sets, such as the number of secure internet service in the country, what is the global cyber security index of a country, the DDoS potential in, and span infections. And finally, for the market readiness, as mentioned before, we are looking into affordability. So uh, ITU provides uh, data on affordability. They, they use different price baskets, such as what is the price of uh, fixed line connectivity and what is the price of a one GB uh, data package. Uh, and they provide this information across um, many countries uh, around the world. Then two, most Im two very important uh, aspect of market structure that we are looking is, first of all, market con concentration. And for this, we are using the Huffindal Hirschman Index, which is a technique used to calculate concentration. Uh, it's usually used in the, uh, by, uh, in, in economics, um, studies and uh, we are using, we are applying this concept here to, um, to our index. The third one is AS hegemony. So AS hegemony is actually the measure of the dependency that would, is set of upstream providers. 
And uh, we are using here the Gini coefficient, which is the measure of inequality in the distribution towards the de this de dependency uh, on um, upstream providers. Finally, we are looking into how much traffic is being kept local. And for this, we use a few indicators. Uh, for the first one being, being peering efficiency, how many ASNs local ASNs are seen peering at local XPs, the, the number of domains, uh, the number of uh, lo lo the percentage of local content which is hosted in country, and finally, um, the United Nations provide the e-government development index, because as you know, the e-government portals usually um, are a good proxy for, for local content as well. So once we have all these indicators and we have collected data um, for them, we need to uh, weigh them. Uh, so when building an index, you have different techniques to assign weights to, to, to the different indicators, as well as, as dimensions and pillars. Uh, you can use statistical analysis between, between uh, the indicators to see the relationship. Uh, or principal component analysis. But in our case, we have used qualitative approach. So right at the beginning of the project, we have uh, conducted a survey to understand and, uh, and ask actually the respondents to, to tell us which of the weights or which of the indicators do you think, do they think that is the most important? And based on the um, qualitative responses that we have received, we have assigned the weights. And it was also coupled with other expert opinions uh, of the interviewing um, different stakeholders. So once we have weighed, weighted the, um, uh, the indicators, we need to aggregate them. Um, there are also different techniques for aggregation. And the one that we have chosen is the, called the arithmetic uh, aggregation. So it's just multiplying the weights to the indicators and adding them all together. And uh, by adding the indicators and then the dimension and then the pillars, we get what we call the Internet Resilience Index. So we have built uh, a, a proof of, of concept because uh, very soon we are going to release that on our platform, uh, which is pulse.internetsociety.org. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, if anyone is, is interested to explore the Internet Resilience Index, they can navigate to this website, tinyurl.com, internet-resilience-index, and you can uh, play a little bit with the, with the data, as well as compare countries in between each other. So if we do a quick analysis, so by, from the data that we have captured, uh, so we have seen that on average, landlocked countries have lower res a lower resilience index, except Rwanda, which is performing quite well. Some countries such as Morocco, Kenya, South Africa are the strongest. And this is also, um, uh, this is thanks to their, their, their good score in all the different categories and all the different pillars that we have, um, that we have selected. Somehow coastal countries are stronger, um, except for one country, which is Eritrea. And um, one of the reasons is that Eritrea, even if it's a coastal country in Africa, has no cable landing in Eritrea, which is actually very surprising. And of course, uh, landlocked countries such as the Central African Republic scores very low, whether it is in performance and infrastructure. So uh, this gives us an indication of uh, what's happening on the ground. And thanks to this, uh, this data, we can now dig further and see perhaps which policies can be applied or, or which are the indicators that perhaps government needs to work on for them to increase their index uh, overall. So that's the first part of the project. The second part of the project is the active measurement infrastructure that we are currently building. And uh, we, we, we use what we call Mirapods. So Mirapods are basically simple Raspberry devices on which we uh, have deployed measurement, infra measurement infrastructure. So right now we are collecting bandwidth information. So uh, the Mirapod are actually running a bandwidth test. 
And we have also tested uh, the deployment of RIPAT last probes um, on these devices. So as mentioned by, by my colleague, Kevin, the idea is not at all to reinvent the wheel. Uh, the idea here is actually to reuse existing infrastructures such as RIPE Atlas and MLAB um, software clients so that we, we are able to all together create a, a measurement infrastructure that, that suits our need. So right now we have deployed, um, we, we are in our testing phase, uh, I would say, and we have deployed in, in 10 African countries. And we have around 20 devices uh, running uh, at the moment. So the idea is actually to, to add a few more devices and gradually to increase coverage um, in those countries. So how are we collecting the data? How is this um, working in the background? So um, down there, you have the different devices connected at different networks collecting the data. And for example, if it's a RIPE Atlas software probe, it is sending data to RIPE Atlas. If it is an MLAB probe, it is sending data to M MLAB. And we have built a data pipeline that is pulling data from RIPE Atlas, MLAB, and other, and, and other providers as well. On top of that, we are adding what we call secondary data. So you can think of it uh, like passive measurement data, um, data that we get from the DNS or BGP. And then um, we have an analytics pipeline, which is crunching everything and finally presenting everything through an API to, uh, to the end user. So the technologies, yeah, I'll, I'll try to wrap up. Uh, the technologies that we're using here is Balena and uh, Google Cloud and BigQuery. So the, these are the tools that we have used uh, at the moment because they are very helpful and they're very easy to, to onboard. Um, of course, in, of course uh, in the future, we can envisage uh, using more uh, open source tools where uh, you can actually um, reduce the cost because right now these, these uh, platforms are, are costing some amount of, uh, of money. So we have, as mentioned, we, have, we are covering a few countries at the moment uh, in our experimental phase. And we have also, we basically have live data coming from these uh, devices, uh, which we are also um, visualizing using Data Studio. Uh, as mentioned, the plan is to um, visualize this data and to deploy this, this uh, infrastructure on at least the visualization part on Pulse, Internet Society Pulse, which is a collection of different uh, focus areas um, and, and providing information about the different aspects on the internet, including internet resilience. So, so our incoming plans, as mentioned, um, uh, visualize internet resilience, the internet res resilience index on the ISO P P Pulse platform. Um, we are also planning to build an interactive dashboard uh, because we found that it is important that users can assign their own weights and get their, their, their I would say their custom internet, uh, internet resilience index based on the weights that they have assigned themselves and not based on the weights that we as ISOC or Afrinic has decided. Uh, the idea is actually to expand partnership because we do not want to focus only on Africa, but we would like to uh, expand to other regions. And we are already uh, collaborating with, uh, for example, um, stakeholders in the Caribbean region. Um, this is coming very soon, actually. Uh, how, to, how to keep in touch and stay informed. Uh, so please visit these links that you see here on the slide, the Pulse platform. You can sign up to the Pulse mailing list where you will have regular updates. And please follow our Twitter handle. Uh, as well. Uh, and then we have the Afrinic Measurement Working Group where we uh, run quarterly updates and we give information about how to host a probe, how to um, uh, deploy one in your network and how also to, to contribute to the measurements which is happening. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Muchas gracias, Amrish uh, y Kevin, por su presentación. Thank you, Amrish.
Thank you, Kevin, for your presentation. We will allow for a few minutes for Q&A. Remember that you can submit your questions in the Q&A section or those of you here in our hall, you can ask for the mic. Jorge, do we have any questions? We do not have any questions yet, but I did want to say that in the chat, in the chat room, we have different information, contact information, and the links that you can follow to get further information on the project. So please, I want to encourage everyone to visit the links. Thank you, Jorge. I will allow for attendees to submit your questions. We have over 200 attendees on Zoom, on YouTube, at the hub in Pergamino, Argentina, and in Montevideo, Uruguay as well. Okay, Jorge, if we have no further questions, you let me know if we move. Actually, there are a few comments on the chat room that congratulate the speakers for the project. They are saying it's an excellent project, so I'm sure there is room for further collaboration. So that's great. Okay, we'll move on to the next speaker then. Yes, Jorge, it was a great presentation indeed. They are telling me that we have a question from Asael in the Q&A section. Asael asks, let me see. He wants to know if you've noticed any changes during the pandemic. Uh, okay. If you uh, observed I, changes during the pandemic. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. So, um, so far, the way we uh, put out the project was to measure, um, you know, how reliable connectivities, uh, you know, in, in the different countries are. And uh, we did not get to the stage of carrying out um, live measurements because uh, our plan was to roll out the mirror pods for the measurement devices uh, over the course of 2020 and uh, 2021. Uh, we did send out some, as uh, mentioned in the presentation, but not as many as we would like, because we thought we would uh, you know, meet at conferences and events and give people the pods, and then those would allow us to uh, have very many pods and many points to measure uh, you know, the effects of, of COVID and how people are, are using connectivity in relation to that. So uh, we didn't send out as many probes. We are looking into uh, increasing that. So in terms of uh, direct data relation, you know, measuring how, uh, you know, the impact of COVID has been, we don't really have that type of, of metric yet because we didn't roll out um, as many pods. Only we can, the only thing we could tell is um, the connectivity, you know, many people are online, many people are using uh, media like like this to communicate and to uh, you know stay in touch, uh, but we are going to be increasing the number of pods over time. So hopefully we'll be able to see a trend as we move along. Uh, I'm really sure if you would like to add anything to that. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So uh, we, we we have for for the index at least we have collected data for for this current year only. Uh, so we do not have visibility on the previous years. Um, some indicators do have uh, historical information, but maybe not in a granular fashion. Um, but the idea is to um, actually collect this data over time and see, uh, and over time we will see changes if there are anything happening. Yeah. Muchas gracias. Jorge, tenemos alguna consulta más? Thank you, Jorge. Any more questions? Yes, by Carlos Sanabria. He's asking how many probes are necessary to have a significant sample in a country? Okay, uh, I can answer that. So uh, we put out initially uh, the plan was to have at least five probes per country and each probe on a different ISP. 
Uh, that was the initial uh, plan, but as I mentioned, we did not manage to send out as many probes, uh, you know, because uh, travel was, was, you know, didn't happen as much as we'd like in 20, 2021. Uh, the reason we are going for five to start with was just to have uh, a different range of measurements from different ISPs. So uh, we didn't want, we don't want to have um, five probes, all of them in one ISP. We'd like to have uh, five probes on five different ISPs. Uh, in some countries, we've already achieved uh, full coverage. So there are some countries in Africa with just maybe one or two ISPs. So we've covered, uh, you know, we have enough probes for, for measuring that country. But we, of course, we have countries with uh, many, many more probes. So uh, to start with, I would say the intention was to have at least five. But, uh, you know, it would be very nice to have at least one probe per ISP in each country so that there can be a variety of uh, data points to measure from. Muchas gracias por tu respuesta. Jorge, no Thank necesita... you for your answer, Jorge. I don't know whether we have any more questions. No, no more questions in the Q&A panel. 